and its baseline energy would have been 3 from the harmonic oscillator, but it was shifted up by an additional 4.8 Hartree, so it had some upward shift, like I expected. Then I find three degenerate states, which were those P states, and you can see they are pretty degenerate. I guess I could have run it out. There's some problem in the last digit. I just didn't completely converge it. And they are shifted up from their nominal level of 5 by 3.9 volts, not volts, sorry, uh, which is, again, less than the shift from the S state, as you know, they always teach us in this atomic physics dogma, right? Uh, well, not Eric's kind of atomic physics. First I do that kind of physics, physics too. Yeah, okay. Well, but, but. Fancier than this. Okay, then the D states, here they are, five of them, one, two, three, four, five, shifted up from seven by yet less. And then finally, just as we expected, even though, you know, it's just a computer, uh, it, gets it, it gets it just right. There's the last of these states. This extra S state is shifted up by a bit more than the other Ds, just as we had expected. Any questions here? Now there's one interesting subtle thing in the data. If you look at these D states, which should be degenerate by spherical symmetry, they are, you'll notice, and it's not just noise in the last digit or two, there's definitely a grouping of three and a grouping of two. If you want someone to tell me what that is. Do asymmetric renomisotropic? Um, well, that's a it could be from anisotropic resolution in the grid, but in this case, I believe it's another effect that's quite real. There's a, something called EG and T2G. This is the classic crystal field split, right? Because I have periodic images of these guys, right? on a cube, and these are d-states, and that's what happens, right, but I don't have to know anything, yeah, Katie's a chemist, so she picked up on that, I don't have to know any fancy chemistry, I just calculate the thing, no, it's nice to understand, but. so, it's just, I think, very neat that these things come out the way, the way you should expect, now, let's so, look at the so, states, yeah, so that's the difference in the, in the crystal, the, like, uh, uh, the ones that look like jacks behave differently than, like, the donut ones, yeah, uh, yeah, Shall we look and see? Here we are. So the, this is, what this is, is this is a slice through the first wave function. This is the S wave function. Uh, M1 just tells you which plane it is, right? It's the X plane. And uh, that looks pretty spherical. <clears throat> just a little uh, proviso here. This was not done on a uniform grid. You know, this is still the silly 20 by 25 grid by 30. So. Uh, the data set's a little longer, longer in this dimension than this dimension, even though it represents the same space. I just have more grid points in one direction. So in my plotting routine, it actually looks a little <coughs> elongated, but trust me, it's, it's a sphere. And then if I look at my next plane, uh, another slice, perpendicular, sure, spherically symmetric, spherically symmetric, S state. State number two should be a P state, right? Now there's a little subtlety here, which is that the way my imaging program works, it takes a slice through the data set, it looks at all the values, and whatever they are, the maximum one, it recodes up to the brightest you can have. So what we're looking at here, this actually is a nodal plane, you'll see it in the next slide coming up. This is a nodal plane, uh, and there's just some noise left over, and there's a little bit of activity in that, in that plane. But if we look here in this plane, you can see that uh, the nodal plane was the X plane I was looking at before, cuts in this way. And what I have is your classic P state from your, uh, from your chemistry textbook. Um, and now we're going to slice uh, the other way through this guy. Let's we'll see what we get. Right. Nice P state. You don't have to know any chemistry, it just comes out. The uh, next state up, in this plane, he looks like a P state already. Right? And then you know, we slice through the other planes. Yeah, P state, third P state, P state stuff. Okay, now D states, we hope. Not cutting quite through the right plane on this one. But, nope, not through that one. There it is. Right? So the two planes we were looking at before were this plane, 
and this plane, which really are nodal planes, it just was, again, the way the plotting amplifies the brightness. And you'll notice the crystal field splitting. This is the lowest energy D state. And these lobes here, these lobes here, right, are not, the nearest atom is right over here along the coordinate direction. Whoa, where did he go? Uh, which one is this one, right? Right, the nearest atoms are in this direction, this direction, this direction, and this direction. And you can see they are avoiding those other atoms. Thanks. Okay, then, you know, whatever, we can go through. There's, again, this one looks just like the previous one, but it's oriented on a different axis. Here's another one of these fourfold looking guys. And then the claim was, then we have the mushroom cloud looking ones. All right. <coughs> oh, wait, this is still Psi 8, sorry. Oh, oh, I missed it. Uh, can't go back, but the next state has the same feature. See? All right, that's your classic. D state with the two things on top and the, the donut hole around, around the middle. And if I slice, in the next slice, you'll cut through the donut hole. Wait, no, not that one. Where is it? Oh, now I'm up, sorry. Now I'm up to the second S state. This is the top state. And you can see, it's nice and spherically symmetric. It's got a node in the radial wave function, as you should expect, and a little ring out here. It's a little hard to see. Come look at the screen later. You can, you can really see that. And then it's the same way through the other one. I just think it's so neat that, like all those pictures from the chemistry book, yeah, they're really real. I never would have believed it, but, but they are. Okay, and then that cycles back around. Okay, so that <coughs> is when we do the uh, chromatic oscillators and the quantum factor. Now let's look at the hydrogen data set. So what you do for hydrogen is we calculate the energy in a series of separations. And I have the data... Here's the graph of my data. So what I'm showing you here is the separation between the two protons in the hydrogen molecule on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis, oh, I have a typo, shoot. This is the binding energy of the molecule. It's the total energy of the molecule minus twice the energy of a single hydrogen atom, which is one single hydrogen atom is 13.6 volts. That's half a Hartree. So the binding energy is uh, minus half a Hartree. There's two of them, so I'm really subtracting off one heart, minus one Hartree, not two times minus one Hartree. That's just, I flipped a bit in my head. But this is the potential then as a function of that separation. So you can see then the minimum energy separation is somewhere around 1.4 atomic units, or about 0.7 angstroms. The minimum, the energy here is the binding energy of the molecule is around, uh, let's see, it's about a tenth of a heartbeat, <coughs> a little more, so maybe three volts. And then the uh, curvature down here gives me the vibrational frequency. And you can just calculate that on the, on the next assignment. Here I'll show you the results. Um, I'll, I'll clear the screen and then put the results up. So here's the bond length. As I said, it was about 0.7 angstroms. It actually was 0.768. There's the experimental value right out of the CRC handbook, and the error is about 4%. The spring constant, uh, which controls the vibrational frequency, is off by about 6%. We take the square root to get the frequency, that'll be off by 3%. Pretty good. Okay. And the binding energy, I said, was you know, around a little more than 3 volts. That's off. Those are usually worse. But, so, but you can actually do hydrogen on the next side. I think that's pretty good. <coughs> okay. Last assignment then would be the germanium crystal. So let's see what you'll get for the germanium crystal. Uh, more GE.txt. You can calculate the cohesive energy off the assignment. This is just a sketch of the calculation. Basically, you calculate an electronic energy, the Ewald energy for a cube containing eight atoms, so this is the total electronic energy of those eight germanium atoms. Per atom, it has this much energy in Hartree's. You then do an isolated atom calculation, which has this much energy, which is uh, less magnitude but higher because it's a negative number. So the energy is lower to go from the isolated atom to the atom in the crystal, which is good, the crystal lines together. It's lower by about this many Hartree. 
which in volts is 4.4, and the experimental value is not too far off. It's about 13% off there. Now these are very primitive calculations you're doing. They're real, but we haven't integrated over the Brillouin zone nicely. There's you know lots of you know, stuff one can do, but it comes out pretty realistically. Now the germanium that you that that you can do in the assignment, I want to show you some pictures of it. The germanium is on a, is in, exists in a diamond lattice, and that's based on an FCC lattice. So <coughs> I'm going to show you the electron density in germanium. So the crystal looks kind of like this. There's a cubic cell that we've calculated with. And it's FCC, so as you know, you got all the corners of your cube. And then you have all the face centers also. And then there's additional structure in the diamond lattice where there are atoms that are out of, off this plane. So what I'm going to show you are the charge density sliced through this plane, the FCC face and then through um, a diagonal plane that looks like this. Through the crystal like so. And in that diagonal plane, you can actually see the atom to which the corner atoms are bonded to. Because I want to see what the bonds are. Ah, there you are. You know, remarkable, you're getting like the real binding energy out of this thing. You know, which you guys can make for yourselves. Okay, the, oh, where are these? So here's the 100 face. So the atoms are centered on the corners in this calculation, as you can see. And then an atom right in the middle of this face. Now, something looks a little odd, <coughs> which is that the atoms don't appear like high density regions, they appear like low density regions. Can anyone tell me why they're low density? Someone not from my group. Yes? I'm not sure. So you replace the co electrons in the nuclear one by a pseudo potential? By a potential, exactly. And as a consequence, those core electrons are not there. So the core electrons are basically missing, and that's why you don't see them, right? Uh, <laughs> so the core looks black. The uh, remaining valence electron. Well, that looks bad. I want to hit that X. The uh, just, uh, persistent little thing. The uh, uh, valence electrons, though, outside the core, then make a nice spherical shell. You can see there's some activity, kind of between them, but that's actually going out of plane. So what I want to do now is show you the plane. This plane. You slice through. It's a little hard to see. Here. This plane here, which will cut along the long diagonal of that cube, um, you'll see the same corner atoms, but you'll see additional atoms on the inside where the bonds occur. This doesn't, I don't know how good this is going to come out with the, with the, the lighting in here, but we'll give her a shot. Right. So these are the corner of the cube, these two. Then you go across the long diagonal here, and this is the other corner of the cube. And so you have your atoms on the corners, and then you have the additional atoms on the inside of the cube that I was referring to. And you see a nice buildup of charge right between them. And this is actually the chemical bond between the two neighboring chains. There and there, and then this chain and this chain. What's the yes. resolution? What's the resolution meaning? Of the, of the like, data? Oh, the data here? This is smooth, right? This is, yeah, I think the original, Pick, uh, what was the FFT box on this guy? No, I don't know. I think it's like on a 32 cube set. Uh, and yeah, definitely to make it this big on the screen, I had to you know, stretch it out and smooth it a little bit. Exactly. Um, <coughs> okay, well, anyway, there's a picture of your chemical bot. If you ever want to know what one looks like, <laughs> you can actually calculate it for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, but that, that's what it looks like here. So, so why is the top layer not interacting with the bottom layer? Oh, it's not bonded to it. Um, right, exactly. Yeah, that's basically what I should, you, you have to kind of look at the, uh, 
the diamond lattice structure. What is happening is that, okay, these are tetrahedrally bonded. So the tetrahedral bonds, you've got these two tetrahedral bonds going down like this. The next two tetra tetrahedral bonds go up like this. So the, 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 they orient up, but then there's a rotation 90 degrees out of plane. So there's another <laughs> layer of atoms here, along here, which is out of this plane. And then those are bonded to these atoms. You kind of see some of the, well, you can't really see. Those are bonded to these atoms here. I mean, these mysterious out of plane ones I'm talking about. They're bonded to these atoms here and to these atoms here. And that cross links and then gives structural stability to the crystal. Now, if you do the assignment, you can slice that slice for yourself. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Good. Other, other questions? All right, so that then wraps up our course. I hope, uh, you know, it's been fun for you guys. I hope to emphasize the fact that in, in computing, Again, the big advances come from the thinking, not necessarily from the numerics. But the numerics are very important. And if you want to make your life easier, you want to be very careful how you do your coding. Right? And think through the physics from the beginning. And better yet, try to find some intermediate language that you can think in terms of, but which the computer can also take as well to minimize the torment of debugging because you can lose a lot of hair pulling on it, trying to debug the code. Okay? All right, did you want to say anything, Eric, on your? Um, I'll be starting on Friday, semi-classical methods. It'll be a lot of fun. Tell all your friends. Voila. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs>